Okay. Um, well, welcome to our podcast. Um, my name is Corey Washington, and this is my co-host Steve Shu. And uh, we're going to tell you a little bit about how we hope our next episodes can be going, and some of the plans we've got for the show. But we'd like to lay out kind of our general philosophy to start. Now, one of the things we really want to do in the show is always present um, a, the opposing point of view, but in a respectful uh, and informed way. Um, we always feel that uh, the, a stronger sense, a stronger understanding of a particular subject emerges when you hear both sides of it. And so, or many uh, sides, in the case, or, may or be. many sides. Yeah, it, it, there may be more than just two. Um, and um, so there may be times when we have a guest on who's controversial and neither Corey nor I agree with what that person's thesis is, but we'll listen respectfully and then we'll try to raise what we think are the most, uh, the most salient objections. Similarly, we might have um, a guest who actually we don't have any objection to what they're saying. We're just fascinated by them and want to hear what they have to say. But uh, nevertheless, we will try as a duty to the audience to still raise some points against their perspective so that everybody emerges with a broader uh, sense of what's going on. I think that's going to be true for a lot of the science shows that uh, come up. You know, first of all, we'll be, be talking to people who well, we're not experts in that area, and so we don't have strong positions about their view. Um, and also, we just may agree with their science, but you know, science uh, works best when you have uh, kind of uh, sort of lay a critical eye at it and begin to look at its assumptions and uh, uh, some of the claims are being made in a critical way. So uh, we really want to kind of have the, it be kind of a good natured, but kind of, uh, you know, sharp, sharp. Yeah. Discussion. And kind of adversarial discussion sometimes. And uh, we won't just be talking about science. We plan to have people on who are philosophers, maybe who want to talk about politics, who want to talk about uh UFOs, UFOs, that's right. Uh, whatever it is, uh, but God, God, yes. Um, so we're very excited uh, about our first guest. This will be the first interview that we've done. Our guest today is Bobby Narayanan, a neuroscientist from Argonne National Labs and the University of Chicago. I've known Bobby for several years, and we're kind of friendly, uh, at least up until this interview. Um, and so I'm going to be the main interlocutor. Corey is welcome to interject, hurl invective at us, disagree with anything that we say. Uh, but I'll try to um, lead the interview with uh, some uh, specific topics that we want to cover. Awesome. And uh, let's start with your biography and your career. I'm going to do my best at just saying a few things about it and uh, would love if you would elaborate on some of the things that yes. I'm about to say about you. So, Bobby, uh, you were born in the United States, is that right? No, uh, in India, Kunur, India. Oh, and when did you come to the U.S.? Um, when I was six years old, uh, five years old in 1980. And where did you grow up? I grew up in a small, uh, most of my time I grew up in a small village called Kunur, India, in the southeast of India. Okay. And then spent a, a lot of my time in Madras, India, or which is called Chennai, India now, uh, which is where my grandparents live. But how about in the U.S.? In the U.S., I grew up in the great state of New Jersey. New and Jersey. I'm more from New Jersey than I am from India. Okay, so you grew up in New Jersey and somehow found your way not probably not far from where you grew up to Princeton University, where you did Correct. your undergraduate degree. Yes. Um, and what was your major? Um, I had an odd major. Uh, I, this will come up over the as we talk about my career uh, because I'm on technically my fifth or sixth career currently. Uh, when I was in, uh, in college, I was really interested in the, in the space of scientific public policy. So I majored in molecular biology and had a second major in, in something called the Woodrow Wilson School for Public and International Policy, which is at Princeton. Very good. And so subsequent to Princeton, you were, a, I believe, a Rhodes Scholar, and you did your PhD at Oxford. Am I Correct. right about that? Correct. And was it at that point that you became a neuroscientist? Um, uh, uh, so there were a few jobs, potential jobs in between, in between public policy and uh, uh, um, uh, where I am now. I really thought I would make a lot of money in healthcare. Uh, so I started medical school to try to just get my understanding of medicine so I could make a lot of money in healthcare. Uh, it was pretty obvious after a year that that's not for me. So I decided, oh, well maybe basic research is the right way to go. Uh, so I'd already done a year of medicine and just randomly applied for this scholarship 
that then I got. And then because I got it, I decided to become a scientist. Great. And and I think your MD is from Washington University in St. Louis. Is that right? Correct. Great. Correct. And so then subsequent to your PhD, you were a, you followed the typical academic research track. You were a postdoctoral researcher at, let me see if I have this right, Boston University and Harvard? I was at Harvard uh, doing my postdoc, and then I was briefly a professor at BU. Got it. Okay. And in, in what department, Bobby? Uh, it'd be, uh, sorry, at Harvard, uh, almost all the departments are variants of anatomy and neuroscience, neurobiology, uh, et cetera. I think at Harvard, it's called neurobiology. And at BU, it's called anatomy and neurobiology. Great. And it was there that you really got into brain mapping. Is that right? Mm-hmm. And I think you have a patent on some kind of device that does fine slicing of brains and then floats the slice on water so that it can be... <laughs> Um, I guess interrogated by, is it x-rays? Uh, electrons. Electrons. Electron yeah. microscopy. Okay. It's like a tiny conveyor belt. Is that right? It is literally a tiny conveyor belt. Uh, um, it, it's a, it is as Rube Goldberg-esque as you can imagine an invention. Uh, and, 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 and I, we could discuss this, but like making a tiny conveyor belt and adding it to the normal workflow of electron microscopy is the reason why I have an academic job right now. So like, like how, how big, Bobby, is this conveyor belt? A conveyor belt is about, in fact, we modeled it uh, on the very old audio tapes. Uh, 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 so it's about eight to 10 millimeter uh, uh, in, you know, in length or, or, or so. And the reason we did it was that it, uh, one of the things, and Steve, you mind if I push past or should I wait? No, no. Uh, well, I, I think this is sort of along the lines of where we're heading anyway. Um, just quickly, maybe just quickly say, so it's eight millimeters and then the thickness of the slice is roughly? Uh, something on the order of uh, uh, each brain slice is on the order of 40 to 50 nanometers uh, uh, in thickness. So or, pretty or thin. Another way to say that is 400 to 500 atoms. If you imagine that an angstrom is about the size of an atom and yep. 10 of those is a nanometer, you get to something like that. And right. the reason we have to cut these things so thin is that in, in, a, in a human brain, uh, there's something like a hundred billion neurons uh, and each of them make 10,000 connections with each other. So that means the number of connections, connections between neurons in a human brain is on order quadrillion uh, or hundreds of trillions if you multiply those two numbers together. The only way you can fit that number of anything into the volume, into the volume of a cranium, if you will, into the volume of a, of a human skull is to make each of those elements extremely small, uh, smaller actually than the wavelength of visible light. Uh, uh, so a neuronal connection is actually smaller than a wavelength of visible light. So you can't use kind of standard optical microscopes to map a brain. You have to use electron microscopy. The downside of using electron microscopy is that the electrons don't penetrate very deep into your sample. They scatter really fast. So the only way you could map a brain is to cut it into a whole bunch of thin slices, each 50 nanometers or so. And you have to be able to collect something like 50,000 slices, each one 40 nanometers in a row. And that seemed physically impossible until a collaborator and I at Harvard were like, well, maybe a tiny conveyor belt solves the problem. <laughs> Great. And, and the, so the, in terms of the actual devices, is it true Zeiss sells a device yes. based on your work around the Correct. world? And so how many of these, how many labs have these around the world? So uh, I would say there are about 15 or 16 labs uh, uh, in the U.S. Uh, that have this device. Uh, and the reason I, I think more people don't have this device uh, is that the device only solves half the problem, uh, uh, which is that once you collect a volume, even something a millimeter cube, so just to give you an idea, that's smaller than a grain of sand, uh, uh, a grain of dust, if you will. If I did it a millimeter cube of a mouse brain at EM resolution, it would be something like uh, a million gigabytes of data. Uh, 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 and so the conveyor belt gives you the ability to capture that data, to collect that data, but we're still struggling with what to do with the data, how to analyze it. Right. The situation you're describing is pretty common across multiple sciences where the instruments uh, that are relatively inexpensive now can be used to collect far more data than we really actually know what to do with. Correct. And in a lot of fields, like uh, Steve would know this, 
apparently, uh, you know, CERN was a pretty good instrument. Uh, uh, <laughs> an ex CERN an expensive also, one. <laughs> oh, sorry? But an expensive one. Yes, <laughs> but hopefully worth it. And, you know, I'd heard that at CERN, they collect similar numbers. They collect 1,000 terabytes a day. Uh, uh, it's not unheard of for CERN. Yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, even... But what they wind up doing is throwing away a lot of that data as they're collecting it. Yeah, it's even, it's even worse than that because at the hardware level, they design vetoes that that choose not to record big chunks, most of the data, actually. It's only piping. The number you gave was the data that's piped out, and that's exactly. after passing through several hardware-level filters. So it's yes. generating far more data than that, actually. But yeah, yeah and, so... And, and it's because physicists are like are fundamentally, um, I don't know, smarter. <laughs> we can remind me to tell you we the story about that. physics and neuroscience. Uh, uh, but they know exactly what to look for, to understand to, for, in their particular system. Something that's interesting about neuroscience is we're not really sure what the right uh, metric we want to measure to understand a map of a brain. So we're forced to kind of collect all the data now uh, and see which parts of it provide understanding. And maybe the future brains that we collect will be able to adopt a certain philosophy where we'll be able to throw away a bunch of this data. So in my notes for this section of our discussion, I, I want I, what I had written was, you know, describe the research um, for a general audience, but then also for an expert. And I feel like we've kind of uh, done that a little bit, but let me turn to my ombudsman, Corey, and say, have we, have, we, <laughs> have we described what he's doing in a general enough way? And also then, what would an expert want to know more about uh, that he does? So I don't want to rain on the parade a little bit, but I think it's actually not clear to the audience what Bobby's conveyor belt does or how it fits into his, Excellent. his so, research. So, so get him to so, elaborate on that. So Bobby, right. we, we don't have visuals for this talk, right? Um, but I think, can you sort of explain uh, basically how a slice, uh, how a slicer is going to work and how they're going to cut yes. thin sections and then what happens to them? It's not like ham. So it's a yeah. lot like ham actually, exactly, right? <laughs> but then you can, so, <laughs> so, so give people a visual image of where you're, of, you know, of, of the size of the brains you're cutting, the size Correct. of slices that are coming off and then where your conveyor belt sits in that process. Awesome. Uh, so uh, this is. Uh, let me start off with what the constraints are, and then I'll tell you how the solution matches those constraints. So the very first thing I said was that we have to use electron microscopy because the density of all the things, the size of all those things in the brain is requires it. Uh, what that means is we have to cut the brain into a whole bunch of little thin sections in a row, like cutting slices of a salami or a sausage or, 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 or et cetera. Uh, uh, and one thing to say is that it's very hard to cut tissue uh, uh, in, in an exacting way because it's wet, uh, uh, it's weird, it squirts around, uh, uh, et cetera. So scientists, particularly neuroscientists, have developed ways to prepare a brain usually a dead brain, a fixed brain. Uh, uh, we stain it with a bunch of metals that the electron microscope can see. And then we embed it in plastic. We literally turn the whole brain into a piece of plastic. And if you can imagine that piece of plastic attached to a lever arm, uh, can, can you guys imagine that in, in, in your mind? The lever arm is going up and down uh, and it's advancing in X nanometer steps, right? Ex right. And that's what we call the sample. Right next to the sample, uh, uh, Steve, uh, uh, if you could draw, uh, draw, make a little fist for the sample. Yeah, and right next to it is a knife. Uh, and that knife is made of diamond. Uh, literally, it's a piece of diamond sharpened down. As that block advances, sections get cut. Uh, those sections then float on water. Uh, and then at the end of that water trough is that conveyor belt. Uh, so, so the this sections- is, So Bobby, so I want to stop, because this is the problem you've solved. I think Many people who've done slice, slices in their lifetime have had to deal with this. Previously, you know, you'd basically have a little slice come off and it falls into kind of some sort of solution. You'd pick it up by hand, by hand. with a tweezer, put it on, on a slide, right? And you do this rep and ha repeatedly. Half the time you mangle the slice because you exactly. twist it a little bit. And so you wanted to solve this problem of trying to get thousands of slices all done perfectly uh, exactly. without, you know, massive carpal tunnel syndrome. Exactly. And in fact, you know, the human record for the most number of slices uh, ever collected is about a thousand or so. Uh, uh, and, and even worse, the people who do it are artisans. Uh, uh, the people who have the patience 
and the uh, motor skills to pick up section after section after section. That's actually a dying form. It's a lost art form. Uh, people aren't trained in it anymore. So the idea that we want, we wanted to produce something that was robust, that we could distribute to labs all over the world and that could scale. Uh, uh, so it turned out the same way John Henry loses to the steam machine. Uh, 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 I suspect these artisans are winding up losing to the, to a conveyor belt. And just like John Henry, they're super upset. <laughs> So I think that gives people a picture of, of Very good. your invention. Yeah, I should say that um, we'll probably put in the show notes links to technical seminar that you've given. I think you gave one, for example, here at MSU a year yes. ago, which has lots of slides and visuals. And then even like I think I've seen on the web little videos of your machine or an animation of your machine in action. And that'll make yes. it clear to people who still are a little bit confused about what, what it does. Yes. Uh, how much money have you made off your machine? Um, currently, uh, because Harvard, uh, 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 you know, essentially owns the patent, I have made zero dollars. <laughs> oh, that's sad. But okay, but Zeiss has probably sold like I don't know mil tens of millions of dollars worth of these machines, right? Or yes. No? Yes. So, it, someday I hope to make dozens of dollars. Uh, uh, but currently, um, I, it, it, I, I, this is neither here nor there. It, the first set of instruments they sold were prototype. You know, they went et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So they felt like they shouldn't share the money for those first X set of uh, instruments because they needed to use it to keep revamping the system. So one of the topics further down my list is scientists are underpaid uh, and society underinvests in scientific research, but we'll, we, will, we won't get, we won't uh, branch off into that just yet. Yes. So <laughs> let's stay on the, the research. And so, um, Corey, you're an expert in neuroscience. Um, what's a thing about what Bobby does that uh, would be uh, that an expert li might like to hear more about. So I guess you know, I'd be very interested to find out, you know, how the techniques that you're using right now, Bobby, uh, are advances beyond what went before. You know, I remember you talking about how physicists throw away a lot of data. Yes. And what's pretty interesting is that early neuroscientists did this almost by accident, but it was very, very beneficial. So as you know, the early stains, right, done by Cajal, yes. using the Golgi method, only stained about 1% of the cell, maybe less. We actually have no idea. Yes. Exactly. Precisely. But as yes. a result, you could actually see individual neurons yes. and, and Cajal is able to see effectively synapses, right? So he, he because the stain was so inefficient, uh, it was sparse enough to get a nice picture of it, which I thought was really fascinating because that's, that's really why it worked. But since yes. then, there's been a whole train of research uh, of ways of mapping the brain. And you're doing work right now, which is using really cutting edge techniques. So. How would you describe your work as an advance of what went before? What was bef there before you came in and what are you yes. doing that's new? Yeah, so I, I think it's a great point, Corey. Uh, I think the advantage and the, 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 the thing wrong with Cajal, by the way, the, the guy uh, that Corey mentions is a guy named Santiago Ramoni Cajal, who won the Nobel Prize probably in the early 20th century uh, for really changing one fundamental view of the brain, which is that it's made of cells. The brain is made of cells called neurons. Neurons have specialized parts to them, dendrites and axons, and that they connect with each other over empty space called synapses or, or, or connections. What's amazing is he didn't actually see a single connection because he had this sparse labeling. And it, you, most of the times you don't know who that cell is connecting to because 99.9% .9 of the cells are not labeled if you will, uh, 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 in the data set. And what most people do is then they go from animal to animal to animal. So if only one of 100 cells was labeled, you might imagine, well, if I do it over 100 animals or, or some 500 animals, you should be able to recapitulate and, it's, and the labeling is random, uh, 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 et cetera. You should be able to synthesize potentially all of that back together maybe into one brain and not go through all the hassle of the cutting and the millions of terabytes of data uh, uh, that, that I'm, 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 uh, I'm claiming that we have to do. I think the main issue with that is that fundamentally brains, especially mammalian brains, are not identical from, from one brain to the next brain to the next brain. If I had the same identical brain, sometimes people think invertebrate animals like flies have the exact same brain again and again and again and again. And therefore, it's possible to sparsely sample the same identical uh, uh, network 
multiple times and make an inference about how that network happens. I think in more complicated brains like mammalian brains, the, who you connect with is actually dependent on who else they connect with. The system itself is it's not identical. That system is designed to, to sort of for the history of that brain. And that history of that brain makes sense when you look at the network, not when you make when you look at individual neurons over many brains that have different histories, uh, essentially different connection matrices, and put it all back uh, back together. Yes. Yeah, so that, another way I, I would say it, uh, if you don't mind, uh, go ahead. is that implicit in the word circuit, uh, a neural circuit, which is the uh, the collection of neurons connected together to make a behavior is this idea of a circle. <laughs> it's hard to say the word circuit without imagining the word circle. So at some point you would imagine that, the, and it should be true, that you could go from a neuron to another neuron to another neuron to another neuron and back to yourself. Uh, 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 and in reality, no one has ever visualized a single circuit in neuroscience that is responsible for a behavior. We just do proxies of it, we claim it's circuitry, but if you ask somebody, the one time perhaps it's ever been done, is a very small animal called C. elegans uh, uh, that had 302 neurons and someone mapped all of its connections by hand manually, like you were saying, these artisans who pulled C. elegans section after C. elegans section. And when you look at that wiring diagram, how that circuitry connects with each other, it's way more complicated and has motifs in it, uh, circuit motifs, repeating things that would be very hard to infer just by looking from single neurons from animal to animal to animal. So the last way to say this, and 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 Steve knows I I, I think this way, I'm, I'm always surprised by why we haven't achieved more in neuroscience. Uh, uh, the annual society for neuroscience is I don't know 55,000 people a year. It's held once a year. I think or 60,000. It's the single largest convention for science. I think the cardiologists used to have more than us, but we beat them uh, 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 recently. The NIH budget for neuroscience is something like a couple of billion dollars uh, uh, a year. And, and only about half the people go to neuroscience. So if you have 100,000 smart, dedicated human beings spending billions of the government's money uh, uh, a year, and you multiply that over 15, 20 years, you might ask, well, what the hell have you guys discovered? <laughs> <laughs> well, but a uh, very hard problem, right? And I guess it's a cliche. Uh, possibly. But the, possibly the, the it's brain, a very hard problem. Brain is the most possibly... complicated thing we know of in the universe, right? Yeah, I mean, I wonder whether neuroscientists say that as job security, uh, 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 just in my opinion. But let me push this a, a, a tiny bit more, Steve, if you don't mind. Another version is that, of course, it's a complicated system. You know, the immune system is pretty complicated. The heart is pretty complicated. The kidneys are pretty complicated. We have gone so far that we can make artificial versions of almost all of those things that I'm describing to you. We're not even close to that, to a brain. One version, my version, is that because neuroscience is theory rich and data poor, uh, uh, most neuroscientists, whether they work in a lab or they work with math, are actually theoretical neuroscientists. They're working on very sophisticated hypotheses, very intimate theories of the brain. How individual molecules can influence memory and behavior uh, is like the standard routine for uh, a, a neuroscience. Given that we don't even know what 99% of the cells do <laughs> based on this sparse staining, it just seems like, you know, we're the cart before the horse sort of thing. I don't know how to do this analogy, but you guys are better at it than I So I, I think you've led precisely into the next point that I wanted to get to, um, which is uh, a statement that I wanted you to react to. Um, so let me let me read the statement, and then we can discuss a little bit more about how the Please. statement's related to the point you were just making. Um, the statement is, tool builders, perhaps secretly, are the real drivers of scientific progress. Broad ideas by themselves can be overrated. So actually love to hear both of you react to that, but why don't you go first, Bobby? Okay, so I'll react. Uh, it's, I think this is pretty telling, and I, do think, I think you did this on purpose, Steve. Uh, I can't agree with a statement more than the statement that you just made. Uh, when I give my talks, uh, uh, I, I do this thing, which I, we can put on the podcast if you want, which is I make a list of the Nobel Prizes uh, over the last 100 years uh, 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 that have been received for a specific idea. Um, and the vast majority of them, I'd say 100% of them, but that's a little uh, probably too much, are because that person had access to a tool or technology 
uh, that nobody else did. And in fact, to go back to my hero, Kahal, who we were discussing earlier, that guy had access to two things that the vast majority of neuroscientists didn't have access to. He had access to this stain that Corey was telling us about that only labels a very small percentage of all the neurons. He didn't invent that. His frenemy, Camilo Golgi, uh, 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 invented that. And he, he was also one of the first people to use a compound microscope with glass diffraction optics uh, uh, to look at brain slices. Now, there are things that Cajal discovered using those tools that I don't think I could discover. I'm not that smart, right? But like I would say 70 or 80% of the things that he discovered, I could have matched if I had access to technology that nobody else had. Um, I guess my reaction to the statement is I think it's really a kind of false dichotomy, you know, between technology on the one hand and ideas on the other. I think it is my reading of neuroscience, history of neuroscience, um, is that whenever you have these kind of significant advances, it's because you have an idea wedded to a technology. Someone had an, a theory and they had a way of testing the theory, right, which may have been novel. But sometimes they had yes. a theory and not super novel technology. But I don't think if you have them separated, you know, if you have ideas without technology, you have pure philosophy. If you've got technology with no particular ideas, that doesn't really lead anywhere any it lead anywhere either. So I think this is this is actually one of my real problems with a lot of neuroscience. I think it's a lot of kind of technology driven research without any particular theory behind it. You know, when I was in grad school, um, the two photon microscopes are becoming very popular. And now they're they're fairly common. Uh, um, but you know, there was our, our lab was one of the few that had them. Um, and people were doing a lot of experiments with the two photon. But it wasn't clear what these experiments were supposed to show. You could get some pretty pictures, and you could see some synapses. Um, I'm not sure they were had never been seen before, but you saw them in a more, <coughs> more brilliant way than you had before. But there was no outcome to that, as far as I could tell. So that struck me as a case where technology was not wedded to ideas. Yes. And I think you know, it's, I think I think the key thing is to be to be successful. I think we agree on this, Bob. You have to have like kind of both. Ideas. I think many great scientists are actually kind of philosophers at the same time. But they've got a way of making these uh, ideas, their, their yes. theories, practical and testable. You yes. Know? I mean, Kahala, I think, is quite interesting. I, you know, I remember looking back at Kahala, and I was actually in a reading group um, early part of grad school. And one person pointed out about Kahala is not only did he have the Golgi stain, he was actually probably the best practitioner of the Golgi stain. He was better than Golgi at the Golgi stain. <laughs> yes. And so his his uh, stains are actually so good, you could. You could almost see the synapses. You couldn't see them in Golgi's, right? And they're a little bit hard to see, but you could see them in Halls and not in Golgi's. When you looked at these, you probably see why he got them and Golgi didn't. Golgi's were just a bit too fuzzy around the connections, but Halls were picture perfect. And so I think it, yeah. it really requires a lot of technical expertise to uh, uh, to do what he did, and that's what I think led to a lot of his discoveries. So, yeah. so Can, Steve, do you mind if I? push back one more time yeah, you uh, on you this jump. because I, I'd go like ahead, to tie the, philo the philosophical question back into the technological question. Go ahead. Uh, the reason I think technology is the answer is because of philosophy of science. So, so let me push back or not push back. Let me try. Let's say there's two main ways to imagine how to do science. The first is this way, actually both ways were published quite close to each other in the 1950s. The first way is if you think of Popper uh, and how Popper uh, Karl Popper, one of the great philosophers of uh, science, said, well, the way science advances is by falsification. I have a theory. Uh, I try to falsify that theory with data. Uh, and of course, technology can help with that falsification. But I really need that theory first before I can invent the technology to, to help falsify it. I think the alternative view of the philosophy of science is this kind of Thomas Kuhn view uh, 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 of science. And, and Thomas Kuhn uh, who I think wrote shortly after uh, uh, Popper did, set, uh, wrote this book called The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. Uh, uh, and in this book, Kuhn makes this argument. He's actually the first person, I think, to make this these words paradigm shift. Uh, he comes up with this idea of a paradigm shift. And his view of science, how science progresses, is a lot different than how Popper uh, uh, views it. In, in the Kuhnian view, the existing scientific world, the, sociolo the sociology of it, does everything it can to prevent the destruction of its worldview of science. Uh, uh, there's an established field. Uh, uh, the two examples, the, an interesting example, is this uh, uh, Copernican versus Ptolemy view of how the planets move around uh, 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 the world. Do they move around the Earth? 
or do they move around the sun? Uh, so there's a worldview uh, for a long time that the planets move around the Earth. And lots of people collect data consistent with that. Uh, of course, it was rudimentary data at the time. And then what happens is somebody collects a piece of data that is not consistent with this, uh, 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 or, or, or throws some dirt into this worldview, which is that it turns out that for all the planets to move around the uh, uh, Earth, some of the planets have to go backwards or, 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 uh, or do weird loops, uh, 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 et cetera, right? And that little um, dirt in the oyster is what becomes a pearl of a new scientific theory. A another version of that is black body radiation. I imagine Steve knows this better uh, uh, than anybody. There's these weird little facts that don't make sense with the worldview uh, that are surprises. Uh, and then you knock down that worldview and build up another. Theory. That's not a gradual view of science. I see the if, speed you're of light. if you're interested in that second worldview, I would argue that the way to do that is to invent technology that reveals a surprise, uh, and, and that the real advances are these surprises in science that knock down views. So even though the two-photon microscope invented by Winfried Denk, who then went on to invent a lot of these connectomics tools that I was telling you about, so that's interesting. Uh, um, the two-photon microscope, I think, ha hasn't been proven yet because it yet hasn't discovered the surprise. It's really good at validating or invalidating hypotheses, but what we want are data sets where the surprise lives. Uh, and my argument, maybe to go back to earlier, Corey, the reason I want to collect all this data in a way that nobody has seen it before is somewhere in there is the surprise. Uh, now, that's not good for granting agencies uh, <laughs> and others. I have to come up with reasons for it. But the reality is, I think that's where technology helps. It is this thing that produces surprises that often winds up being the truth. That's my last piece. Sorry. I do want to get too deeply into yeah, the we can do it. We can do hours on yeah, this. Um, you know, I think there's, I think the, you know, I think the Popperian view is some parts of science work that way. Neuroscience, not so much. Yes. I think pop Poppers, I think, mostly thinking about uh, physics actually and the chemistry to some extent. And Kuhn's right that certain 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 anomalous phenomena do arise that lead you to get out, uh, sort of change things. Kuhn is a very strange kind of um, almost anti-realist view where he thought these paradigms are almost self-sealed, right? And you couldn't really talk about falsification at all. You're just moving from one paradigm to another. And it's not that one was more true than the other. It's just like a different idea system. It's almost, Kuhn's almost postmodern, I mean, in that sense. Or um, maybe the people have adapted him to postmodernism. It's possible. Even in him, right, he says things that are pretty. A little, a little bit, yes. A little bit like that. Yes. Um, but I think each of these, each, both have something to say. But neuroscience, I think, if you look at some of the developments, it's pretty interesting, right? If you look at, um, you know, you know, for instance, you know, when people discovered, uh, uh, you know, the currents, when Hodgkin and Huxley did their, their uh, voltage clamp experiments, um, they didn't have a kind of new technique, but they also had a certain theory about, you know, you want to be able to control for voltage while looking at currents. Sure. And out of that, you know, uh, began, out of that, they made, they made a mathematical model that although it did not postulate channels as physical entities, effectively had, you know, sodium and potassium channels in it. So, you know, they pretty rapidly developed this theory uh, based upon uh, certain assumptions which drove their technology use that then led to a huge range of other experiments, right? So yes. the idea, there's a, a kind of general idea first, a technology, much more specific idea after that, and then, you know, correct. since the modern neuroscience took off. But you know, I don't correct. want to hijack Steve's narrative here. No, that's okay. I, I, I don't have much to object to in anything that either of you said. I, I would just say, and I think most scientists would agree that Technologies are important and ideas are important. I mean, the latter maybe just because the space of possible hypotheses is so big that you couldn't just randomly generate hypotheses and test them, you would never finish. So you need some sense of taste or some way of narrowing the set of ideas that are worth testing, that are worth spending all this uh, time developing technologies to test. So I don't think there's too much super controversial in that sense. Oh, uh, Steve, can I try to make it controversial? Okay, well, if you insist, go ahead. Okay, I always insist. I'm assuming that's why you invited me to a podcast yes. called No Go Perfect. ahead, go ahead. <laughs> Here's the last piece. There is no person in, neuro very few people in neuroscience practice either Popperian or Kuhnian uh, 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 science. By that I mean, I have never met a neuroscientist, especially the more famous they get, who is interested in disproving their theory of the brain. Uh, 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 most neuroscience, and, 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 and Corey, uh, I can see you, you can't see me, so you don't see me smiling. We've gone through theory after theory, long-term potentiation, 
is the basis of uh, uh, memory. Spike timing dependent plasticity is the basis of memory. Retrograde nitric oxide, some crazy thing that was the molecule of the year, is the basis of memory. All these scientists who come up with a theory don't want that theory to die. They want their theory to actually be correct. Uh, but is this, this true? Is, why... is this true? Scientists and human beings in general, Bobby. Nobody wants to hear anything falsified. Yes, I think it's a matter of degree, though. Yeah, uh, I, I think the best, say, physicists uh, wouldn't, you know, defend irrationally defend their pet idea. Yes, um, but I think the incentives are what Corey says. I mean, almost everybody does actually defend their idea a little bit too long. Um, yes. maybe all the way to the grave. Yes, oh, that's that's the worst case scenario. <laughs> but certainly a little bit more than than an uninterested. Uh, observer who hadn't written the key papers in that for that particular hypothesis uh, would defend the work. So I, 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 I agree with that. I don't disagree with that. Um, well, then maybe I'll try something controversial later. <laughs> okay. Let me, let me go on to uh, another statement, which I want you both to react to, which uh, maybe it is controversial, maybe it's not. Um, but it's sort of my view of what's happening uh, right now a little bit. Um, so let me start with uh, AI. So in AI, we've made a lot of progress in uh, using things called deep yes. neural nets. And deep neural nets really are, in a way, a kind of crude cartoon version of how the human brain might operate in the sense that there are layers and there are connections between the layers and there are things you could even call neurons or synapses. But in any case, individual nodes of the neural net affect other nodes and there's a certain strength by which they affect uh, other nodes. So there's a connectivity and then there's a strength of connections uh, within that uh, network yes. of connectivity. And we have examples now of really successful um, deep learning, really successful neural nets. So for example, um, recently um, a company called DeepMind uh, trained uh, a neural net called AlphaGo, which yes. outplays the best human players in Go. And, yes. and Go is a, a game which has been played seriously by humans for thousands of years. Um, and most computer, computer scientists thought it was going to be a long time before computers could beat humans at Go, but now they've just, in a very short time, totally eclipsed humans at the game of Go. <coughs> now, uh, unlike your problem, uh, the trouble, the, the huge effort you have to go to to image the inside of, say, a mouse brain or something like that, um, yes. these scientists or engineers at DeepMind can just open up the neural net which plays Go. They can open yes. up AlphaGo and they know everything about it. They know yes. its connectivity. They know how the connections work. They even wrote the they wrote the way in which information is processed yes. <laughs> uh, by um, that network. So there's nothing unknown to them about Correct. AlphaGo. Well, let me, let me however, let me push back on that, Steve, because well, isn't it? I mean, this was sort of so many of these connections were just were done by simply cyclical learning of uh, previous games of Go. So that, so the many many connections in this neural network, and it's not clear they actually know how it functions. They know that it gets the right answer, but in fact, these, these scientists scientists actually do ablation experiments on neural networks to no, see how they the, function. Well, sorry, so, so this is this is the point I'm trying to make, actually. Okay. So, so from a descriptive viewpoint, yes. there is nothing further to be learned. I mean, it, it is represented fully in silico, so the, the, the actual neural network, the, the, the anatomy. The anatomy, the anatomy okay. is fully known of okay. this neural network. Okay. Yes. So it's as if, as if Bobby's program had been carried through to completion. So yes. you had a complete one angstrom level resolution map of the mouse yes. brain. Okay. Uh, and even more than that, you had uh, really accurate dynamical models of how like a charge build up here would do something here. So, so they yep. know everything. Like given initial, given the state of AlphaGo at time t, they can tell you perfectly what the state will be at time t plus one. Okay. No question. No question. Now, where in that huge body of information, it's millions of connection strengths, millions of numbers, right, that specify the neural net. Where in that is an understanding of the game Go? Yes. Uh, so you can have an example where, and so this is related to the statement that our brain might be too complex to be understood by our brain. Yes. So what I mean by that is even if you gave me a perfect anatomical description and even dynamical description of how our brain processes information or shifts electrons around, um, we might never actually locate in the brain the exact place where um, it knows that uh, if it rains at night, the lawn is wet, uh, right? That's a thing that we think most humans can figure out, that little syllogism. Yes. But uh, we may not figure out mechanically how it's represented by right. all the complexity of information we get from the anatomical description of the brain. And right. I think that's kind of clear now from what's happening in deep learning and deep neural nets, that um, there is no way we can really open up um, 
AlphaGo and figure out the game of Go, at least not easily. Now, Corey yep. actually already leaped ahead to ablation experiments where you, you say, like, well, let's suppose I blow away or randomize some yep. sub chunk of connections. What does it do to gameplay? Like, does the yep. thing like start making bad moves, but only bad moves in the opening or only bad moves in this subset of situations? So you can probe it, but that in and of itself is a is a maybe perhaps hundred year project to figure out how does Alpha how is the game of Go represented yep. within AlphaGo? So um, maybe just react to that. Uh, so I would agree, Steve. I think the assumption is, why would anyone imagine we would understand a brain anyway? Uh, uh, meaning, I would say it another way. Uh, what, what do we actually understand about biological systems uh, 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 that we that isn't essentially reverse engineering or an, or an engineering principle couched as understanding? Now, this is going to dive us possibly deep into what the word understanding means. Uh, 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 whether I understand what understanding means, we get into these weird loops, uh, uh, et cetera. But this doesn't surprise me at all. It would be similar to saying, do you expect a dog to understand regular physics? Uh, no, of course, brains have limits and capacities. And, and I would argue we barely understand so, anything about but the brain. But to, to say something a little bit controversial, if I were to go to the annual meeting of the neuroscience, whatever it's called, association, and poll yes. people, uh, have them react to that statement. Uh, how many of them do you think would have a relatively deep understanding of what that sentence might mean? Our brain is too complex to be understood by our brain. Well, can I jump in here? I, I think partly it's just the question is a little bit um, kind of grossly formed, right? The, the idea of understanding the brain as a whole level, I think, doesn't make a lot of sense. I think, and this is true of biological phenomena. And, that, and in that's general. broadly understood by neuroscientists. I, I don't know. I haven't polled people. I think well, so. Well, you, I think, you I live think in so. the community. Yeah. I, no, I think so. I think people, okay. people work on tiny, tiny phenomena. This is true of biological phenomena in general. Here's an analogy. Suppose someone says, you know, how does the natural world work, right? How does the earth work? You know, I see these animals, you know, and they get some food, and then they go mate and have some babies, you know, and then things dying. It's just, it's all so complicated. I mean, well, you, you just know, gave a nice compressed but, description. So, 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 but, I, but, I narrow, I narrowed, I, but I narrowed down to a small, tiny yes. phenomena. I exactly. didn't try to theory of the exactly. whole thing, right? That's, exactly. That's one of the what how biology works, neuroscience works. You have tiny theories, generalizations that don't go very far, applied to a fairly small region. Maybe there is a similar phenomenon in another animal, or similar phenomenon in another part of the brain. But you basically have micro theories, and that's how it works. The idea of a global theory of the brain, I think, is is fantasy, right? Um, yeah, I, mean, maybe, I agree. Maybe some I mean, super intelligence could have it, but. Very good. I'm pro reverse engineering. I mean, at some level, I can make the case that I understand brains to a pretty good approximation already. If I didn't understand brains, how can I live my normal life? Uh, uh, I make predictions, which is one version of understanding, about brains around me all the time. Uh, uh, not as a neuroscientist, but as a human being living and working in the world. I can make predictions now about if I started talking politics with you guys uh, 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 or sports or, 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 or whatever. I, I, I'm, as a human being, I'm really good at making predictions about brains. The question is whether, uh, 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 whether from a bottom up I can make predictions, uh, whether taking these small facts uh, exactly like what we're saying and turning them into broad general theories, I'm not sure that's ever worked. So, um, Bobby, let me, let me, uh, in reference to this particular topic that we're on, let me reference a little short story that I wrote on my blog <laughs> as a character in the story. So uh, you're working in your lab with your slicer and dicer and uh, electron <laughs> microscope. You're working very hard and you've got uh, like a thousand grad students slaved uh, in harnesses doing whatever they need to do. And I come in uh, down from down the hall carrying a little box and I said, hey, Bobby, look what my former post <laughs> Uh, he works at Deep Brain now, and uh, this is the very first uh, artificially intelligent uh, device. It actually has passed the Turing test, it passed the advanced Turing test, it passed Turing test five. Um, and look, uh, it's, a, it's a little neural network that they trained in a virtual world. So they actually have the neural net and they trained it, but then they instantiated in this, uh, this little blobby uh, silico thing. Before we go on, Steve, I have to stop you. You need to explain what's the Turing test, what's the advanced Turing test? Turing test five, just briefly. I know we don't have a lot of time. Uh, Turing test is a, 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 a functional way to determine whether something has quote real intelligence or art, you know that an artificial intelligence is is really past some milestone. And the way the test is conducted is by just uh, having people probe the artificial brain and ask it questions, um, see if it can learn things, 
And if it can fool them into thinking that it's a human, then in some sense, it's got at least a sort of human level of intelligence. Um, anyway, in the little story, I run into your lab and I'm carrying this box and um, the box is a physical <laughs> instantiation of a neural net that was trained maybe inside a computer, but it now can do all kinds of things that the human brain can do. Maybe it's even smarter than the typical human. Um, and then in the story, uh, to poke fun at you, uh, the character that is Bobby in the story, rushing over, grabbing the box out of my hands because you want to immediately start imaging it yes. to figure all the neural connections uh, that are going on inside the box. And I, I sort of weakly try to explain to you, no, Bobby, we've got that all. Like I could print it out. <laughs> but, but you were just really obsessed that you wanted to measure all the uh, connections between all the little sub pieces because after all, this is a super intelligent alien being that we've just discovered. Uh, what do you think of my uh, little story? So is, you, is that in fact what you would do, Bobby? Uh, wait, sorry, which part? The, uh, you, if you had the brain, would you be inclined to try to image it if there was a data set showing where all the connections were anyway? Fair point. Uh, uh, I mean, if Steve said, here's this box and here's what we call the wiring diagram, which is how every neuron connects to every other neuron, I'm generally not a trustworthy person. Uh, sorry, I'm not a trusting person. I think uh, that was a Freudian slip. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I would I would think about whether I trusted Steve or not, and if I didn't, I would redo it. But if I trusted him, I don't see any reason to go to redo the wiring diagram. That part of the story was an exaggeration, because if you really <laughs> understood that we had actually produced the thing through artificial means and therefore had the wiring diagram stored somewhere else, uh, he wouldn't grab the physical object. And, but it was meant to poke fun at this, perhaps what could be interpreted, and I think maybe some other neuroscientists interpret as an obsession with measuring Yes. Uh, uh, from the, the gain from which is uncertain. That, yes. That characterize it. Absolutely. In, in fact, Corey, another thing that Steve has called me in the past is kind of the ultimate stamp collector. Uh, uh, that I'm literally interested in collecting every stamp of every connection of every neuron uh, uh, in a brain. And there were times where that was useful, you know, D Darwin cataloging all the things he cataloged with the Galapagos uh, is stamp collecting. I think it's a very fair question to ask, is there a return on this? Do I have to collect every stamp? What if I just collected 30% of the stamps? Would I be okay? I don't have good answers to, to these questions because it hasn't been even partially done yet. I, I think my initial reaction when I learned about the, the really, you know, the big advances in brain mapping and how far we had come was, wow, that's amazing. We should just do it. Uh, in terms of the total neuroscience budget or scientific budget, it's it's not such a big fraction. And so why not just get a decent, you know, X level resolution map of the brain? Let's do it. Um, Corey has sort of argued that it's kind of clear that uh, we don't really need that right now. We're not going to get all that much out of it. Maybe there'll be a surprise that people didn't anticipate, but people can't point to right now a high probability gain that we'll get from such a detailed map. Is that fair? Yeah, I just, I'd, I'd say let's look at history, right? We've actually got some pretty good small maps of different brains. And there's no doubt we've learned some things from anatomy. Um, but, you know, again, I think, you know, anatomy works in conjunction with physiology, right? You first learn where connections are, then you probe those connections by measuring electrically from them. And then you may begin to get an understanding of how a certain set of cells reacts to stimuli. But that's where I think the, that's really personally where I see the value in anatomy. Instead of sort of going whole hog and mapping everything, you make you basically make it uh, a part of a kind of broader theory development program where you learn where things connect, you learn how those connections behave, then you try to understand a small region of the brain uh, rather than sort of going for it. So that's uh, that's kind of very different from your approach, Bob. I'd like to hear your reaction to that. Yeah, um, uh, I'm kind of defending I'm, conventional uh, yeah. small scale okay. neuroscience. Sorry, Corey, I didn't hear the last part. I, I guess I'm, I'm really giving you a kind of, uh, uh, as you use the uh, kind of Kuhnian statement, I'm giving you a statement of kind of the current mainstream neuroscience paradigm. Yes, yes. So I would, uh, and then, you know, take this with a grain of salt because I'm super biased. Uh, my argument is that this kind of functional mapping uh, of the brain is what's wrong with why you don't understand the brain. Uh, uh, and I'll argue, if you don't mind, specifically from neuroscience, but also by analogy. Um, the kind of analogy I'd like to make is to another big mapping project, the Human Genome Project, uh, uh, which also, when it was introduced, people said, geez, this sounds a little unnecessary. Uh, uh, we already know where all the genes are. 
Why do we have to map all the regions that aren't genes? Uh, 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 why do we care about that? And it turned out, of course, that the comprehensive map revealed that the non-coding regions, what, we, what I learned in college was called junk DNA, uh, is hardly anything but. That was the Kuhnian moment, perhaps, for genomes. Uh, once we did the whole genome, we realized things that we didn't before. Uh, that's the first. Uh, the second is, if you think about how the genome worked, nobody ever mapped a functional gene. Uh, uh, that's because the function of something and the way so neuroscientists test it is just an ad hoc made up uh, 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 explanation for what a human brain thinks the function of a neuron is. Uh, uh, and, and we've really gone really far with this. There are visual systems, there are paravisual systems, you know, all, all of these things that human beings from, you know, ablation studies, from uh, 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 functional recordings, have, have sort of set up these maps. If you made the functional genome and you said, well, let's map the function of every gene, it will be a complete, um, I can't curse, but it'll be a complete S show. Uh, you can curse a little. Uh, 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 the reason is that every scientist who works on a particular gene thinks it has some weird function related to whatever it is that their personal history of working with that gene is, number one. And, and number two for neuroscience, the really crazy part is when we test stimuli on animals, we're testing like, I don't know, less than 0.1 percent of the universe of stimuli. Uh, uh, we never look at stimuli in combination, you know, very rarely audio, visual, olfactory, uh, 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 et cetera. Um, and the response properties are super simple compared to the wiring diagram, uh, the 10,000 connections that, that, that neurons have. There's something wrong about this. There's something wrong with sampling a few neurons with a paucity of a stimulus space uh, 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 across many different conditions, who knows whether their eyelids are dilated, what their personal history was uh, uh, just before these functional maps were taken, and then trying to collate, accumulate all of that and make sense is as crazy, I think, in my mind, as making the functional gene. And the anatomical genome, the anatomical map, what I like is there's an easy start and there's an easy finish. Uh, in the genome, I started with the first base pair and I got to end with the last base pair and say, I'm done, here's the data set. Uh, uh, I could do the same thing in an anatomical map of the brain. I could start with the first connection and with the last connection and say I'm done. Uh, in these functional worlds, I feel like it never ends. Uh, at least I haven't seen it converge uh, uh, in, in my time in neuroscience. Okay, was that controversial enough? I'm really trying hard. Um, that's pretty controversial. I think you know there, there are many ways to kind of <laughs> respond to that. Um, what I'd say is, look, you know, I mean, and I'd like to begin with one argument, which is that. Um, again, if you're looking at a, a global theory, right, I think your argument may hold water, but we've learned an enormous amount from neuroscience, right, by folks on very small, with a molecular circuit phenomenon. I mean, you know, all the lists of people who won Nobel Prizes, you know, uh, often they worked out some particular system, uh, at least some of the mechanisms of some particular system. So take uh, you know, the, the lab that I was in, Richard Axel, right? Um, there, you know, they, they work on smell. And part of the idea has been, first of all, you know, they, they first cloned uh, the genes in mouse and then they went to flies, which is actually sort of unusual direction going to more complex to simpler. Um, but they now be, begin to understand how the olfactory system works. Uh, they can, people are going to core from hundreds of cells right now. It's a fairly small brain. And we do have an understanding now of how uh, smells are processed in the olfactory system of these, these animals. Um, so, you know, again, we're not aiming at a global theory, but nevertheless, if you view neuroscience as simply another version of biology where small theories are what dominate, uh, then the approach seems to have been bearing fruit, whereas this sort of whole anatomy mapping um, hasn't really borne fruit so far as I can tell, right, at a global scale. It seems like we're trying to solve a problem which we, in our, we I thought we kind of agreed, may not be solvable, which is the brain at a kind of macro level. Uh, so that's, that's one of my, 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 my first responses. Now, I think in some sense, the analogy, I think, between the functional uh, genome and, say, functional neurons um, is actually has led, is sort of different. We have learned recently that there are cells, a large number of cells in the brain, right? Glial cells, which you thought essentially had no function whatsoever. Yeah. And now it's clear that they do. So that's been a kind of revolutionary development. Maybe not, it's certainly not on par with realizing that non-coding DNA uh, is in fact regulatory and controls uh, many functions of the brain. But we to, now know to that- To say something controversially, I would say anybody who was smart knew that that could not all be junk DNA, that, that protein coding could not be the only thing that's happening 
uh, inside your genome. But anyway. And maybe you could say the same thing of people who thought the glia, right, uh, yeah. served no function in the brain. But here's a case where at least there was a consensus over a large part of the field uh, about whether it had a, a function. Um, and now we realize that they actually do have function. So here we found a case of, of the brain, some region of the brain which was thought to be non-functional now, and it opens up a whole range of uh, investigations we can do. So I, I've said that, so I guess I've made a couple of claims, probably, which is, again, I, I still think that uh, the standard paradigm uh, has worked extremely well on the understanding we're going to get small local theories. Uh, the best thing to do is probably start with simple brains, uh, because those are ones, if you want to have an understanding of the global scale, you have a better shot than the human brain. And there is a case where we've actually have uh, come to see that something which was putatively non-functional is functional. Okay, just on that last piece, only because I like arguing, so I apologize. Okay. Two uh, minutes. Uh, sorry? Get, take two minutes and give your point, okay. because I'm going to switch the topic. That, uh, uh, I just want to make a case for simple and complicated brains, uh, because I've seen this uh, rub, or, or I've seen this shtick uh, uh, a few times, and I, and I want to tell you my shtick, my version of that shtick. Uh, uh, my version of that shtick is the average lifespan of Drosophila uh, is a couple of days, uh, uh, maybe a week, two weeks. Uh, I don't know the exact number, uh, but you, you tell me. More, I think they can, we don't know the natural lifespan, but they can live in the lab, you know, up to 60 days. Okay, two months, uh, no yeah. problem. Uh, the number of progeny born per reproductive cycle is over a dozen, maybe hundreds, uh, uh, et cetera. If you look over evolutionary time, they've had way more cycles of evolution than we have. Uh, the average lifespan of a human, okay, you know, absent whatever, is decades. The average number of progeny born per uh, reproductive cycle is way less. So evolutionary pressure has been working dramatically on the fly. Uh, uh, and in fact, it's a much more evolved organism than we are. Uh, I think it's true just of insects by in general. These numbers alone. And a lot of neuroscientists try to pull this bait and switch where they say, well, I'm going to work on a simpler system like the fly and figure out mechanisms and uh, uh, et cetera. But it's actually a bait and switch. These animals, these invertebrate animals are way more complicated than me. Well, they're, 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 they're more, they're maybe have, they may have gone, undergone more natural selection than we have, yes. but in terms of so, the structural uh, complexity specific... of their brains, clearly less, right? Uh, I'll Number give a specific example of this. Okay. Uh, in the fly and in the worm, uh, uh, which is another model system. It's not that individual neurons compute, uh, at least in the worm, different parts of the neuron compute. So a dendrite, a piece of a neuron, might compute something completely different than the axon of that neuron. And those two might never talk to each other. Uh, and that immediately makes the system way more sophisticated at some level uh, or complicated than these integrate and fire, uh, the way we think about the entire neuron firing. Uh, 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 in the mammalians. Okay, so let, just let me Please. let me reformulate that a little. So you're saying that um, from a naive analysis, it seems like the Drosophila or whatever it is is actually less complicated than, say, our brain. However, yes. because it's undergone so much evolution, it may be processing information in a much in a radically different and actually more complex way, even though it has sort of fewer atoms in it. Yeah, in fact, one version of this, but you guys please push back, is that a lot of these simpler organisms are analog computers. Uh, uh, they don't actually work in the digital, uh, a large, sorry, large fractions of their brains are analog computing. Uh, they don't fire what we call an electrical spike when they reach some threshold. Uh, uh, and I don't know the math, you guys will know it better than I do, but analog computing in certain ways is more sophisticated than digital computing yeah. or complicated or, or or et cetera. So I'm not sure if the inference, uh, the understanding no. is going to flow from invertebrates well, to us. I think you're, uh, right, you're right to say that uh, even if computer one has N1 components and computer two has N2 and N1 is much larger than N2, it doesn't necessarily mean that the functioning of computer one is is more complex than number two because of the reason you gave that the actual met, the, the actual mechanism by which it's computing could be quite different. And we have redundancy, apparently, humans have redundancy uh, in ways that the fly doesn't. You can remove you know, uh, a, a substantial part of a human's brain, either by injury or, or et cetera. And, and a, lot of their, a lot of the things that they do don't get affected. I don't know if the same is true in this world of ablation uh, 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 in a fly brain, where things are super okay. specialized and perhaps less redundant. I'm gonna I'm gonna cut it there unless Corey has something really urgent he wants to say. No, no. How could you not, Corey? I'm trying my hardest. To get <laughs> right out of you. Well, I don't. I, I'm not saying you were right, but there there is a formulation of what you said which isn't obviously wrong to me. I, 
Yeah, look, I think I don't want to delve too far into this, but right? okay. the, there's no doubt that you know invertebrate neurons have many different functions. They're often not unidirectional in the same way that vertebrate neurons are, and they do uh, they often do sort of perform different functions the way the vertebrate neurons are actually much more specialized. And sometimes we have the luxury of having so many neurons, we can have neurons which are yeah. relatively specialized, yeah. although perhaps not as specialized as neuroscientists have hypothesized and thinking you know that this neuron performs this particular okay, function. I'm, I'm going to cut you because okay. we're running out of time. Sorry. Back, back to my one of the topic sentences that I mentioned earlier, scientists are underpaid and society underinvests in scientific research. And I want you to react to that, Bobby, first. And I'll just, um, I'll just mention that you and I have a common friend, maybe a guy you went to Princeton <laughs> with, uh, you were Rhodes Scholars together, and this guy is running a monster hedge fund and killing it. And every time you talk to him on the phone, you feel like killing yourself. Am I, am I exaggerating? Perfect. Okay. So tell, tell us, react to my sentence. Scientists are underpaid and society underinvests in scientific, underinvests in scientific research. Um, okay, I, I'm going to disagree. Uh, I'm going to be very specific. Okay. I think I'm underpaid and undervalued. Uh, <laughs> okay, good, good. And I happen to be a scientist. Yeah. I don't know if that's, that fits exactly into your motif. Um, but a net total no, amount of payment, not payment per dollar, not payment per scientist. It's actually the opposite, I suspect. We have way too many scientists doing neuroscience right now. Uh, uh, so overall, I think... Way too much relative gross, to what, Bobby? Sorry, relative to what scale? Return on investment? To or? what we're paying and what we're discovering. Uh, <laughs> how would you know what's appropriate to... I mean, can, how can you run this experiment, right? Do we have another sort of control set where things are being run properly and we're discovering lots and lots of things yes. with the same number of scientists? Right. I mean, how would you defend that claim? Right. We have one experiment, which is people doing science right now in the current world. How do you yes. know how much you should be discovering? We don't know yeah, how hard so the problems one, are. One, this is a really good point, Corey. Thank you for pushing me back on this. Uh, uh, I would argue that one way to analyze this is the more money and people you throw at a problem, is the answer converging or is the answer diverging? Uh, uh, the, the more effort I throw at something, am I arriving at F equals MA? Like, am I converging on this idea that I'm going to arrive at F equals MA? Or the more people that I throw at it, the more equations actually come out. The, it, the results are actually diverging. Uh, uh, we're not getting towards a unified theory of the brain. But, we're actually getting to more theories. But remember, our, our, our previous discussion, what I'm trying to suggest, there is no unified theory of the brain, right? There are many, many tiny, the tiny theories of small parts of the brain and small phenomena associated with the brain. There is no, yes. there's no special relative. There's no general relativity. There's no, you know, uh, fundamental laws of particle physics for the brain. It's kind of sad, Corey. What? Oh, what why I, I feel bad for these people? Why? why the world's complicated. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, wait. Let me push back if, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, it's just physics and chemistry. Uh, it's not magical, uh, and we have taken complicated systems like hurricanes or or or, uh, 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 or, or uh, uh, and 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 sort of understood them i see steve saying no already so i'll back it well, up also much simpler too in yeah, many yeah, ways but simpler. keep keep talking but how are they yeah simpler is this word i i just i, I never understand neuroscientists use it all the time uh, uh, uh etc but there will be an equation that a global equation i don't know how many parts and how nerdy I have to be to understand it, but there has to be, right? Now, one version, it doesn't have to be, let me just push back on on, on myself, but it will totally screw all of us if it's not, <laughs> which is that <laughs> the reason I can't get, an, I can't analogize from physics or chemistry uh, uh, to biology is that biology has evolution thrown into it. That's uh, the key, that's it, Bobby, that's everything. That's everything in this state, right? It's a haphazard system thrown yes. together to keep organisms alive and reproducing yes. over time. Agreed. No reason to think there'd be systematic laws yes. governing Agreed. everything that's happened there. If something gets yeah. there and has happened to work, it stays. Yes. And and that could be actually, and I suspect that is actually what we'll find, uh, is that there are very few principles when we do these kinds of global brain uh, 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 analyses. And each little part of the brain is going to have its own little rules, how to wire up, how to imagine, uh, 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 et cetera. Uh, I, I can buy that. But at some point, they're all connected to each other. <laughs> so, meaning, let me say it another way. Every neuron in a brain 
has to be connected, given a certain number of connections, to every other neuron in a brain. Uh, uh, has to be. Otherwise, you have two brains, uh, 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 two independent brains. I, I'm going to make that argument. I, I suspect it's true, but I have no idea. So uh, uh, on sorry. the nature of biology and evolution, I don't think we're disagreeing, actually. We're actually probably almost all in exactly the 100% I agree. But I want to come back to the poignant plight of mid-career scientists like yourself. Are you, are you not gonna? Are, are you gonna? Are you gonna lie the early whole early career scientist? I just that? got started really late. <laughs> okay, well, scientists at your at the, your current point of career. Got um, it. You, I think the listeners and the viewers want to hear something about what your day to day life is like, the emotional roller coaster, uh, why science is hard. Uh, are you happy you went into it? Are you happy where you are in life? Most of me is unhappy about everything. Uh, uh, that's my general view, uh, uh, et cetera. But if you want me to drill down on specifically why I'm unhappy about science, it turns out that at least in biology, at least in, in, in my in my version, once you get your own lab, you never actually do experiments anymore. You never actually touch, uh, oh, sorry, never is, is a rough word. It's a very, very rare to, to actually be the person who discovers something. To actually be the per person who solves you're, uh, you're managing uh, uh, others yeah and in fact my life is the opposite i'm somewhere between an accountant and a salesman and an hr rep uh uh, uh and that is what being a scientist is on a day-to-day -day basis i have to worry constantly about money to keep the lab going i often have to worry about relationships in the lab that are preventing us uh, 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 from getting data. I have to think about who, my, who I should put as reviewers for my paper and who I should exclude as reviewers for my paper. There's a way more like human level thinking and, and, and relationships. And I hate it, dude. I'm terrible at that. That's why I didn't want to be a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hear you. I, I, do, do you think what his, do you think his comments are comprehensible to the modal listener or do we, should we elaborate a little bit on the things he just said? And they may help to elaborate because I think there's a picture of science which is yes. much more isolated yeah. so and much more pure. I think the average that. person thinks a scientist goes in the lab and is thinking deep thoughts and maybe tinkers with their device and has a eureka moment and everyone immediately realizes it's a big discovery and they shower him with uh, laurels and uh, et cetera. Yeah. When in fact, every day is a huge struggle. You're managing a team. The team is really making the discoveries. If you're successful enough to have people working for you. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. Well, I'm assuming someone's, you know, succeeding in the scientific enterprise. You're begging funding agencies and foundations <laughs> to give you money to continue your projects. Uh, you're worried that you're going to have to fire a postdoc or a, a grad student if a particular grant doesn't come through. When you finally get your beautiful results, you're churlish peers fail to understand why it's important. <laughs> they misunderstand your clearly written paper. They reject it for the wrong reasons. Everyone is out for themselves. Uh, did, did I leave any bad aspects out, Bobby? No, uh, You're sleep fact, deprived. we just had, uh, yesterday, we had a meeting with all of the assistant professors in the biology department, meeting with the guy who decides our tenure. Uh, uh, and it, we had a, it was an hour long meeting where uh, he said, you know, he, he wanted to teach us how to get tenure successful. University of Chicago has about a 70% uh, 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 tenure rate Pretty high. Uh, uh, yeah, in high. biology. Uh, uh, and you know, I sat down and I, he started off with, you got to publish papers, you got to get grants, and you got to be a good colleague. Or, or, or sorry, you have to teach, excuse me. Uh, uh, publish papers, get grants, teach, right? And then he said, that's what everybody tells you. But not all, that has very little to do with getting tenure. Uh, it has a little bit, but not as much as you think. And what really matters for getting tenure is basically the advertising campaign that you engage in uh, <laughs> self marketing uh, uh, along the way. Uh, uh, and, he, and he was right. And he had a bunch of reasons why you wanted to do this. As soon as you get a paper out, I don't care anymore, dude. I already, in fact, I stopped caring before we published the paper because I already knew the result and I'm interested in the next thing. Uh, 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 but you know, that's not how it works. Like, you got to publish that paper and then you got to, you know, what do they call it? Go on a book tour. Uh, <laughs> You know, or, uh, I don't want to. That part stresses me out, man. It, it, it's so it's funny that you say that, Bobby, because, yes, I mean, the way people market themselves, um, the way they push their results, I think, has a huge impact, at least at the sort of elite level in science, whether you're going to make huh. become like a kind of superstar um, at Michigan State. I, I it's funny. Right before we recorded this, I recorded a video message about the promotion tenure system here because I'm actually huh. on the committee that that does that. 
uh, here. And, and I was trying to emphasize how things are fair and you'll be judged on your <laughs> publication record and your grants. And, and I didn't nowhere in my uh, presentation, in my video, that I, little video that I recorded, did I say anything about self-promotion. But wow. uh, realistically, realistically, we know it's true. And apparently at Chicago, it's, it's very important. Um, yeah. We're out of time. Oh. So, but I want to give you a chance to do one more thing. It's the last item on my list. Uh, I heard you once say that professors must profess. Yes. And I like to say professors love to profess. Yes. So I want to give you a chance to react or to, to answer the following questions. Where will neuroscience be in 10 years? Yes. And in 50 years? Yes. What will drive this progress? Yes. What are the most exciting milestones that you anticipate? And how should resources be reallocated, if, if they should be reallocated, uh, within the field? And I would love to hear Corey's answer to these questions as well, but not today. And we have plenty of time okay. to discuss Sorry, it. Sorry, Corey. Other, uh, uh, other by the way, it's your show, Bobby. Like, uh, Go ahead. Yeah. So you get the last word. OK, thanks. That's like some Adam Sandler movie where he shows up for his final exam, and they have like, <laughs> We only have one question with 18 parts or something like that. <laughs> nah, it's only like six, whatever. It's fine. You can, well, you can leave anything out you want to leave out. Yes, please. Uh, and, and what I mean by that quote that professors have to profess things is I'm just sick of professors who don't have opinions about things. It's, it, it's pointless to not have an, to, to have an opinion. You want to attack opinions, you want to argue. So I'm going to use that vein. Um, I think in 10 years or 50 years, there's going to be some weird. There's going to be a very little difference between neuroscience and computer science. Uh, um, I'm not sure which is going to be a subfield of the other, but my prediction is that neuroscience is going to be a subfield of the computer science uh, 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 world. The reason I think that I'm probably wrong, but the reason I think that is that right now you can't really function a high at some high capacity neuroscience lab without having a set of your team or your collaborators that are essentially computer scientists to handle the thousands of neurons that we're imaging uh, 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 in real time, to handle the billions of connections, the mo uh, to track behavior and keep track of terabytes of behavior. Computer scientists are already invaluable for neuroscience. I suspect at some point in the future, I hope, neuroscientists are gonna become valuable to computer scientists because there are things about how the brain computes that's gonna be very hard for our hardware to do. The one that I always talk about is that brains are 20 watts, uh, hardware is not. Uh, uh, when you're talking about an algorithm beating Go, uh, an algorithm beating a human at Go, it doesn't beat that human when you divide it by the energy it took. Uh, there's a denominator, the, the, num the numerator is how well it does. The denominator is how many watts it took to achieve that uh, 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 result. When you do that achievement over wattage, uh, hum human brain still killed. Uh, 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 and I think someday the computer scientists or the people who build out uh, hardware or software are going to be learning from us, hopefully, just like they did with the very first machine learning algorithms, like you were saying, Steve. The very first machine learning algorithms, it's a very famous Japanese machine learning scientist who based the very first visual uh, machine learning algorithms on the cat visual system, on the network, on the nodes of the uh, uh, cat visual system. The precedent is there. I suspect the more we learn about brains, the more they're going to find it useful. And there's going to be some mind melt between computer science and neuroscience. It, 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 of course, I never thought about it, but it seems so obvious now every day that we've both been studying the same thing, which is intelligence, uh, or, or not intelligence, but which is uh, uh, how brains get jobs done. And I think that's what will happen. So that was two of the four questions. Uh, I, I Most can't exciting milestones along the way? I, I think that really, for me, the milestones will be reverse engineering milestones, uh, will be where the things uh, uh, that brains do, we figure out ways to put into algorithms and robots. Uh, uh, I'm having a list, uh, uh, like, you know, it'll start with maybe perception and move upwards, uh, 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 or it might start with mo movement or motion. Uh, 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 and move. I suspect the wiring diagram of a spinal cord could help somebody make a better robot uh, uh, based on that kind of whatever control theory, uh, 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 et cetera. So I think those are the milestones that we'll see. And in terms of funding, you should really fund me and nobody else. <laughs> well, how can, we, with that. how can we argue with that? <laughs> All right, well, unfortunately we're out of time. Uh, thanks a lot for joining us on the show. Corey, do you want to have any final? This has been great, Bobby. You're a fabulous guy to talk wait, to. I hope we get to talk more about neuroscience, Corey. I do, absolutely. 
and uh, look, I think this is a model. If we can get guests who are as fun and engaging as Bobby, I think we'll do pretty well. Hope you'll come back, Bobby. Yeah, dude, I do accents. And since you can't see me, I can come back as somebody else. I'll be great. Yeah. <laughs> can you come back as Steve? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, can you, can you uh, pass the Turing test as Steve Shue now? Yeah, I don't think I could do Steve, but I have a pretty good Cockney accent if you want to interview a bunch of Beautiful. English, English scientists. <laughs> All right, well, we'll invite you back for the comedy hour. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Talk to you guys very soon. Okay, okay. Bye-bye. Ciao. Well, let's stop there. And uh, if you enjoyed our podcast, let us know. You can send an email to Corey or myself. And uh, we'll see you next time.